You're listening to the Pagan Center Podcast, bringing unique and intelligent perspective to the masses using contemporary technology, allowing for free discussion of one's personal beliefs and enlightenment of those not familiar with a particular religion. We bring to the forefront many issues that are ignored or shunned upon by mainstream religion. We discuss topics on a religious and non-religious level as they relate to our panel representing varied belief systems. Our brute honesty and candid opinion has made us one of the longest running and most popular pagan podcasts. Feel welcome to call in live or submit listener feedback via our website, pagancenteredpodcast.com. Listening to the, to the animal. Exactly, yeah. I completely agree. Yeah, the rest of them will get over it. I mean, if they want to go boss someone around when they're dead, they're more than welcome to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so have you had any really striking experiences where, I think it was Snooze you said that we're not crafters, that we're just taxi services for the, the animal parts. Have you had any oh, really yeah. striking instances <laughs> <laughs> where that's really stuck with you and really forced you to say, yes, this is where something's going or anything like that? Yeah, actually, when I first read this question, uh, when you sent me the link for the uh, uh, notes and stuff, um, I was trying to think about that. But then it occurred to me that actually one of the most striking situations that I've had was with you and the headdress that you got. Because it was such a strange deal. You remember, I was talking to you, and you had just you know, inform me about this whole situation and, you know, it was really, really nice of you to do that because otherwise I would have been bombarded with all this hate mail and not known why. But um, <laughs> I actually recently uh, had just gotten an email from a friend of mine who was an artist and she said, hey, I have this really unusual coyote that I think you might be interested in and I've had it for a while, but I don't really want it anymore. And I said, well, you know, we'll meet up and I'll look at it and if it's something that I think I'll enjoy, then yeah, I'll buy it from you. So we met up in Portland. It was like a nasty, rainy day. Met up in a parking garage so that the skin wouldn't get rained on. And I took one look at it, and I thought, well, that's just perfect. And so when I did post it uh, on Etsy after we took the photos and everything and I'd completed the headdress, um, I had actually listed it at a much higher price than I did end up selling it to you for. And uh, part of that reason, of course, is that if I could get away with doing this without being paid, that is something that I would do. But unfortunately, the supplies and the time, you know, I kind of have to make money. Yeah. <laughs> it's how mm. it goes. But I was really, really happy when you bought that one. So I'm really glad that happened. Yeah, it's fun I have when to they say. pick their own people to go to, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to say that when you when you posted that, I had gotten drawn initially to another piece that you had. Mm -hmm. And when you posted the the coyote up, that one, I didn't think I would get such a strong calling for it, but it's, I'm so excited when that actually comes in the mail. You have no idea. Yeah, I just shipped it out the other day, so it should be arriving pretty soon. And um, just oh, to, cool. to revamp for the people that haven't been here, do you want to go over a little bit the, the type of negative interaction that actually brought us to communicate? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, actually, do you want me to read the, uh, uh, the one piece of mail that is radio appropriate? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I want the ones that are not appropriate. That's the ones I <laughs> want to hear. <laughs> I, I, Those are I, the I ones that are the that. most fun. Yeah. I want to hear too. Kara, that you get to post-produce all the <laughs> expletives out, so, you know. Yeah. Well, this, this is one that I got. It's short, sweet, and rather to the point, so, um... I got it through Etsy. This guy apparently made his account simply so that he could send me this uh, this email. And it said, Wolfskin headdress? Really? What the hell's the matter with you? Bet you wouldn't like it much if they fashioned a mask from your face and wore it around. Find some morality, loser. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of thought about that one for a while. And I ended up replying with, if after I died, my skin were tanned and treated so that it wouldn't rot, then yes, I would rather have someone make a mask of me than allow me to go to waste. I've actually made earrings from my own wisdom teeth, and when I had a bone removed from my foot during surgery, I made that into a pendant. I've worked with human knuckle cool. bones and human hair in the past as well. It doesn't bother me in the slightest because I see no difference between the worth of the life of a person and that of a wolf or a cow. If I... We are all living things, and the value of our lives is equally important to each of us. Who are you to say that one deserves more value than the other? Simply, cut, simply put, according to my own spiritual beliefs, letting any part of any animal go to waste, regardless of species, is disrespectful to that animal. But I do not buy parts from trophy hunters or fur farms, and only buy tanned skins and parts which would otherwise be wasted. 
I understand that you have different views on the subject than I do, and I respect that. I would simply ask that you respect me and my beliefs in return. Thank you. Gee, she's Nothing. a lot nicer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Good I know. For you. My I reply would have been. Yeah, my reply would have been two words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm more of the school of thought of. Good. I would have told him what he could do with an animal part. <laughs> <laughs> It'll fit somewhere. Yeah. I would have just said. Replied, you know, if someone turns me into a headdress, that would be freaking awesome. <laughs> as long as I'm already dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told one that if she wanted, what I'd do is just ask some of the whites, the animal spirits that come along with some of mine, to come visit her and let her know what they thought of it. Yeah. That'd and be she went in the bathroom and nobody saw her for an hour. <laughs> I got to tell you, though, your your written reply that you emailed back to that person was fantastic. And that does kind of encapsulate your philosophy of what you're doing as an artist in, in working with these animal parts. Yeah. Well, I do feel it's really important for people to understand where I'm coming from on this. Because if I were the kind of person that, you know, just replied with some, you know, rude comment, then I'm sure that would only just fuel, you know, their their side of the story. Which, you know, personally, I don't really agree with. So, it's definitely helpful to me to reply in a manner as such, you know. Now, but. have you had anybody give pers- uh, give more positive responses after you replied to the people that sent you hate mail? Uh, yeah, I did, actually. Uh, somebody confronted me right on the uh, Nature Punk uh, Facebook page. And they were uh, after the same thing of the wolf headdress. And, um, you know, they were asking, well, you know, can't you see that you're just supporting, you know, people to wear animal parts? And I told her that all of the people who've come to my shop have always shown a lot of respect for the animal parts, even before purchasing them. And a lot of people will choose to go to my shop as opposed to somebody else's simply because of the sources where I get my animal parts from. And that is one of the biggest things that I look for in feedback from people is when they say, you know, thank you, thank you so much for, you know, getting these parts from places that are ethical. And I truly believe that, you know, it's not supporting it simply because people are supporting the fact that I am not buying it from fur farms or from trophy hunters. Can you go into a little bit of where them. you do get? God snooze. No, no, you're good. Go ahead. Sorry, Amber, could you repeat that? <laughs> Can you go into a little bit of where you do get your parts from? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, one of my absolute favorite places to get parts is antique stores. Um, I absolutely love antiquing. Now, it sounds kind of strange coming from a teenager, but, um, oh, my gosh. Walking into antique stores and, you know, just seeing something, it kind of makes your heart skip a beat. And you're like, I want that. And, you know, the price isn't always right. But depending on the situation, you know. I'll see something I just absolutely have to have or something that just draws me to it. And that's happened before with um, deer antlers, everything from uh, leopard pelts. You know, I've worked with all kinds of stuff. And all of my absolute favorite things have always come from antique stores. But I do get a lot of more modern stuff from uh, people who are like taxidermists. A lot of taxidermists don't use um, all the parts, like teeth, for example. Um, All taxidermy mounts with the open mouths actually have plastic teeth put in. That's because they last longer and it looks better. So They don't turn yellow. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, being able to get sources like that kind of stuff. And then, of course, there's the Fish and Game Department. And every year they have an auction uh, over in Idaho. And it's a huge auction just full of all the stuff that they get from, um, like, roadkill or things that are confiscated. um, Stuff that is from animals which were killed without a permit and it's a pretty fun deal. I also have several friends that work with the fish and game department. Actually the girl that lives right across the hall from me right now, her dad works with the fish and game and over the spring break um, she came back and she has a Corsican ram skin and she's like, here my dad said you could have this so I thought, well that's pretty cool. I'm gonna figure something out to do with it. Oh cool! Yeah. I gotta move to Oregon. <laughs> I like your fish. I, I like 
department from the sound of it, the ones around here, if they catch you on the side of the road, even picking up a roadkill, get really, really icky with you about it. I've spent yeah. a good bit of time hoping, riding down the road going, please don't have a cop stop me and ask me why I have a dead beaver in the back, in the back of the car. <laughs> it just, yeah. you know, it's like, yes, officer, that is, in fact, a very flat beaver. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like in Oregon here. Well, uh, it kind of depends on which state you're living in, but in some states it actually is legal to pick up roadkill. But there is something that you can do um, is call your local fish and game department and ask them about getting what's called, I think it's called a scavenger's permit. Oh, no, and no, 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 not here, not here. Really? <laughs> no. Ah. Well, know. which state are I'm, you in? I'm in North Carolina. I'm actually okay. much better off. I can usually do a sob story where mm -hmm. I'm the one that hit it or I have a fictitious niece that just got her driver's license that hit it and uh -huh. it's making a, one of us so sad and I said I would come bury it so that she oh, didn't okay. have to drive past it and see it every day and if I cry a little bit most of the time they don't they'll just yeah whatever you're weird but you're crying so we're going to leave you alone. it's about the only time I pull the female crying trick yeah. but it's yeah fish fishing game in this state does not want to actually work with anyone they're 100 percent enforcement so i'd rather actually have to deal with them as an oh my gosh you mean that i can't do that than yeah. try to actually go through official channels because it hasn't worked in the past that's perfectly hey, i'm liking the sound hey, i'm liking the sound of oregon though yeah <laughs> i uh i thought you all ate roadkill in that part of the country is that not right <laughs> did i get that wrong Oh, come on. You can't do any better than that. <laughs> yeah, it's not like no. she's in Pennsylvania where people are poor and it's totally legal. Come on. That, that's, like, that's like making jokes about the about a veterinarian down the street from the Chinese restaurant. Come on. You can come up with better than that. I've read your writing. <laughs> My Thanksgiving dinner was uh, roadkill turkey. Yeah, we eat roadkill. Like, not me personally, but hell, you, you, yeah. will, you will have people eat roadkill here. Well, the uh, guy who was... Uh, uh, who actually picked up this turkey, he was uh, driving behind a woman who actually hit it. So he saw it get hit, and it was like instant death. Just this poof of feathers shot up, and the turkey kind of like swirled around off to the side of the road, and he thought, well, um, Thanksgiving's coming up. So he went over and picked up the turkey and uh, brought it to a co-worker who butchered it, and we had a wild turkey stew. Nice. Well, if you get, if you get lucky with one... You know, as far as I'm concerned, not wasting something is the highest form of actually having appreciated it and, and exactly. you know, hated yeah. its due. On the other hand, some things, unlike wine and cheese, do not improve with age. <laughs> and I sometimes I'm I'm out, you know, what I'm getting, I keep a cooler and plastic bags and plastic gloves in the car for a reason. Because yeah. sometimes... We're there, but again, if that's what they want, then that's what they're going to get. And if I can manage to do it, then I've, I've, you know, kind of gone the extra mile. But it's the other thing you have to worry about if you're actually doing a roadkill thing is not only blood, you know, you get um, between having bloodshot meat and I, I, I've tried that one time, and the bone splinter still makes the inside of my mouth hurt. Mm. So I just died. Yeah, I am. Um I wanted to ask uh, both you ladies. Um, I I do a lot of roadkill refurbishing, and um, sometimes the bits that I'm picking up are not as fresh as I'd like them. And I didn't know if you guys <laughs> had any tricks. I mean, I keep I keep bags and gloves and and everything in in the back of my car as well. And I think half of my um, fetishes that I've made um, have come off the side of the road. Um, but I didn't know if you guys had any tricks that you've learned along the way that you'd like to share. Because um, I think scavenging for parts is something that people don't talk about a lot, but a lot of us do. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know snooze. Um, well, now this is Sarah's this show, is, so, you Or know. Sarah. Well, it, it, either of you, if you had any, any tricks of the trade that you'd like to share. Well, it kind of depends on what you're working with. Um, if you're working with some of the older stuff, the things you probably have are going to be the bones, that kind of thing. Um, one of the best tricks for cleaning bones is not to use bleach because bleach will actually make the bones brittle and they will deteriorate over time. Instead, uh, using a hydrogen peroxide is the best way to whiten them. And if 
they're still greasy, you know, like they still have, you know, like a, kind of a yellowy color to them, then a mix of water and Dawn dish soap will pull the grease right out. What about, um, Sarah, when you're dealing with um, antique furs and skins? Mm -hmm. um, I know I've picked up parts with the intention of using them, and then they tend to fall apart on me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fur, does, fur blows out real after the after the skin's lost oxygen fairly quickly. Yeah, is that just it, for is curiosity. That is what? Pretty much. It's just inevitable when it gets to that stage that there's no salvage. Yeah, it's it's really hard with skins. I mean, you kind of have to do trial and error, and then after a while, you'll be able to just look at one and say, "Yeah, I can use that one," or "No, I can't use that one," and. It's it's kind of difficult, especially if you're you know going to be buying something online from an like an online antique store or um, an auction or one of those online estate sales that kind of stuff. But you know it just kind of depends on the skin, and uh, there's a lot of luck involved too. Just for curiosity, a minute ago because I have a lot of people actually ask me this a minute ago when you're talking about them not being as fresh. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about processing or are you talking about dealing with them while you're processing because the number one question people ask me is oh my god how do you stand that smell without throwing up oh uh well the smell is something <laughs> that i've just kind of gotten used to over time but um oh there's a good trick for it but it's that's what it the one that, that i've always found that works really really good is always 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 keep a bottle of pure vanilla extract around Go ahead really? and spend the money and get the good stuff. Mm -hmm. The smell of pure vanilla, and they, the imitation will not work. The second the alcohol burns off, it's no good. Yeah. There is something about the chemical components of the smell of vanilla that will mask anything from a necrotic maggot infestation to advanced decay to that that nasty greasy smell that you get when the when you've had lipids soak into the bone matrix that she was talking about and you can also use you can also soak them in acetone if they're really bad mm -hmm. uh the smell of fresh van of really good fresh vanilla extract will mask any of that mm -hmm. it just the there's something about it it doesn't it overcomes everything it's brilliant okay. stuff yeah well thank you for sharing that it's a good trick to know i i was using lavender actually uh, I've always loved the smell of lavender, so that just seemed like the first thing to go to. <laughs> lavender smells great, but it there it has something to do with vanilla, the chemical components in the the scent particles of vanilla that overcomes something in your brain. It doesn't it doesn't actually have to do with the how pleasant the smell is. It has to do with yeah, the smell yeah. interfering with something else being absorbed. I, mean, I I got a paper on it here somewhere, but I'll God if I could find it. There's no telling where it is. <laughs> Well, if you find a link to it, just like go ahead and post it somewhere. Score. Ah, we had right. a comment in the chat room that asked, um, "Have you ever had anybody ask you to prove that they're dead before you skin them?" Um, actually, prove they're dead. Prove like what? Um, I do not actually do any of my own skinning for um, obvious purposes. A, I'm living in a dorm room, so I uh, <laughs> don't really think anybody would appreciate me bringing dead stuff in and out of the dorms. Um, also, part of my personal um, ethics is that unless it is really fresh roadkill and unless, you know, it's a situation when I'm okay to, you know, take the skin, um, then I would have to send it to a tanner because I can't do the home tanning stuff, uh, the chemicals and things that we use for most of that, it just gives me really bad headaches. Um, so mostly when I'm using skins, I am using stuff that's already tanned. And that's also to ensure the fact that, um, you know, the animal was, like, actually recycled. Hmm. Most of the time, by the time I get them, it's a pretty dead giveaway that they're not there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of puns. <laughs> I apologize to my homeland. <laughs> Just for curiosity, too, I'm, I've got a question for you. Yeah, um, sure. I usually, I've gotten aware I'm using cedar shavings and a cedar shaving pack with bugs mm -hmm. for soft tissue removal. As opposed, um, I've tried maceration mm -hmm. and 
even with changing the water like every 24 hours, I'm still getting that lipid saturation that gives you, you know, the, the greasy smell and the greasy feeling that, you know, then I've got to try yeah. and put it through an acetone yeah. bath for. And I've had a couple of people tell me that I'm just, it, you're just not doing it right. Uh, have you ever, have you ever done maceration? Or? I've not done maceration. I actually had a friend that lived down the street who had uh, domestic beetles, and so I'd always use those. And Ooh, I, lucky. Yeah, <laughs> those things are great. I, I always found that the domestic beetles were the absolute best way to go ahead and do it. And it's also kind of neat just to have them, you know, they're very, very interesting creatures. It sounds kind of weird and morbid, you know, them being flesh-eating bugs and all, but they are... Yeah know very 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 successful at removing you know meat from bone and they can strip an entire deer skull in like two or three days so that's definitely yeah, something that. i would say if you're if you're going to continue doing this for a long time and you think it's something that you are really dedicated to then uh investing in a domestic beetle colony would definitely be a good way to go i tried that and the thing that i hadn't taken into consideration at the time was that when you're not processing something you still have to keep them fed and we had a bad yeah. problem ah. so it's, i went i went there for a while where i wasn't running across anything or let me rephrase that where i wasn't encountering anything that i could <laughs> chuck in there with them and i accidentally starved everybody to death so one one thing you can usually do is if you have a um if you have like a butcher somewhere near town, or even if you're just going over to the Albertsons or something like that, they they always take out the bones. My uh, boyfriend actually works at the uh, meat block at an Albertsons, and um, they usually get you know small bone type stuff with some meat still left on it, and um, you know just leave that out in the sun for a few days so it dries. The beetles always like it when it's dried, and um, then you know you can just feed them with that. Even if you're not going to you know use the bone for craft stuff. It's still something to feed the beetles with. That's true. It's I don't know. They're the the guys around here. The few that we have that process meat. If I can get a couple of the farmers, they'll actually do stuff. But most of them send their animals off somewhere commercial to have them processed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I have a hell of a time. Almost everything I get is either roadkill or things that hunters will give me or have brought me. I. Anything that's actually domestic livestock, the only time I ever come across it is if someone processed their own without without going somewhere and didn't have to encounter any Food and Drug Administration laws. I got yeah. I got a steer a Longhorn steer skull in there right now that I'm working on named Maurice, and I I got him because someone found a dead cow in their back pasture. <laughs> they still don't know how I got there. <laughs> hmm. Well, um, how are you cleaning that one right now? Uh, I've, I've got him down. He actually was fairly clean by the time I got him because he'd been left out in the open. Um, the last little bit that I've got and everything, I've just gone back and I'm, I'm down now to scraping what little bit of uh, cervical ligament with a razor blade because it doesn't, nothing's been interested in eating it. Yeah. Well, um, but other than that, it, it I was lucky he was clean when I got him because he's a big boy. Yeah. I, I do know that uh, one trick that works around here, uh, the Northwest, it's, you know, usually pretty, uh, well, rainy around here. And um, mm -hmm. we do have a lot of uh, bugs that just naturally um, eat, uh, you know, decay and that kind of stuff. So one thing that you can do is you can create your own little decay cage, make it out of like a chicken <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Miles, honey, you want to tell her what the backyard looks like right now? <laughs> you have those? Oh, Christ. In the best in the backyard, the world against the back, In the backyard, <laughs> against the back fence right now, we have one, two, three, four, probably five or six wire dog cages. Seven, <laughs> she's holding up her hands, eight, nine. Wire dog cages stuffed full of wood shavings and straw and whatnot with tarps across the tops of them and i don't remember what's inside them oh, honestly i my. don't um one amusing thing from about three years ago at the old place we used to live when there was some i don't dear i think processing <laughs> in one of those dead one of those dog carrier things they use on airplanes okay yeah we lifted we lifted the tarp off this thing, and so many 
generations of flies had been breeding and reproducing under this tarp, that they had evolved into a wingless species of huge fly. They didn't need to fly anymore. They had evolved a whole subspecies of walks because they were non-flying flies whose all their life needs were met right there in the hay, in the bone, in the carrier. Goodness. It was fascinating. That is it fascinating. Was, People are like discovering your own species. Cool. You're creating your own species. Yeah. Well, it's... <laughs> One of the best things in the world to use is that we get people here all the time that will dump dog carriers because the door rusts away. Yeah. And it takes me all of five seconds in the shop to cut a plywood door or a pe- out of a piece of old, you know, fence or something and mm-hmm. just throw it across the front because it's not don't like I have to open and doors. close it. The dead oh. goats can't run. Right. <laughs> and you just, you drill holes in the bottom for drainage. Mm-hmm. And I like to use cedar shavings. Mm-hmm. Because not only does that keep, I, I unfortunately right now I'm living right in the middle of downtown and have close neighbors on either side, so I've got to kind of watch my smells. Yeah, yeah. And the best thing in the world about the cedar shavings is not only does does it absorb the liquids as the soft tissue breaks down and it helps control the smell. Mm-hmm. It's it doesn't do it in the winter time, but in the summertime when it heats up, the cedar oil will also absorb into the bone matrix. So you get this really neat, almost sort of, you know, the normal aging that you get Mm -hmm. from bone that goes kind of yellow brown. This will go, it has just a little bit of a reddish, purplish tinge to it. That's neat. And it'll it'll be reminiscent of sort of a cedar type odor, uh, which is way more pleasant when you start drilling. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, definitely. (laughs) But it... Yeah, the old dog crates work fantastic and you're keeping them out of the landfill that way. Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's I had so many flies and you know ants and bugs and things can still come and go in and out of it. I have to keep them closed up because I have to worry about predation from something else yeah. chewing on. I mean, com- coming in and finding out that Muggsy is dragged about a week and a half old skunk into the living room and is cheerfully, you know, working on it. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> but they, yeah, old dog carriers work great. Yeah. I've never tried dog carriers. We just used to uh, make a big cage out of a chicken wire, and we buried it, like, uh, half in the ground. We'd anchor it to something so that the uh, raccoons and the other scavengers wouldn't take off with it. And uh, you could leave it there for about six months. And by the end of that six months, you would have a very nice, naturally, you know, darker patinaed skull. And it would be... Personally, I prefer the ones that have a more natural patina to them than the ones that have been, you know, cleaned and whitened, look all shiny and nice. But um, it was a kind of interesting deal. My mom, she really did not like it. <laughs> but uh, my art teacher actually allowed me to have a bone room in her backyard. So, But I like, I've seen, I've had bone that I've been able to bury in potting soil because I didn't have anything else to put it in right then. And mm-hmm. it's come out absolutely gorgeous. But mm-hmm. the dirt here... We're in North Carolina. We have red clay mud. Yeah. So unless I want it to look bright orange, <laughs> it, I, it, I just have to keep it out of the dirt. But it's the cedar. The cedar does a really nice effect. Well, I'll have to remember that for when I'm out of college. It's kind I of found hard to have bones here in the room. <laughs> the best effect to do is, is when you find... Um, some skulls that are, are mostly defleshed or just you know completely weathered and old. If you hide them under a stack of towels in your mother's linen closet, towards the bottom, <laughs> she'll <laughs> never find them until <laughs> until company shows up and she wants to get the good company towels that we don't touch anyway. And then screams when there's like deer jaws falling out at her. <laughs> But they have this great kind of snuggle smell to them, you know, like a nice fabric softener, patina. <laughs> that wouldn't work for me. My mother is obsessive-compulsive. Wow. <laughs> no, my mom is just a very, very uh, uh, clean person. She liked to have a very clean house, and I appreciated it, but she was not too happy about the time I had bear soup out on the deck. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yeah. have to know then, what's your favorite, hey Sarah, I have to know then, mm-hmm. what is your favorite 
oh my god, freak out the neighbor's horror story. You've got to have one. Oh, um, let's see. I was living in the Cayman Islands for a while, and um, we had just found a minor bird that had um, apparently had a window and broken its neck. So it was in perfect condition. But um, normally around here in the Northwest, if we find a bird or something, um, hold on a second. I have somebody knocking on my door. This is... Uh. Hold on. Hey, Naria's got a question too. We need to give him an opening. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right. Okay, so yeah, we found this minor bird. It was in great condition. Normally, if I want to preserve a bird, I will put it on salt to dehydrate the body and the feathers and everything. You know, they stay very nice, and you can usually pin it to a board or something so that it's uh, preserved in the position that you enjoy. Well, in the Cayman Islands, that doesn't really work that well because it's very hot and humid there. And even if you're keeping it in a, you know, airtight container with a bunch of salt in it, it's still not enough to dehydrate the body. And I did not know that. So hmm. we'd had this thing left in a airtight container full of salt and dead bird. And I took it out um, to, you know, remove the bird after it had been a few months. And um, we had... The children's elementary school was right next door. I opened it up, and I started throwing up. It was such a horrible, horrible smell that came out of it because this bird had rotted. So I'm standing there over this bucket with a bunch of salt and a dead bird in it, and I'm throwing up. And all these kids are looking over the fence like, what's going on? Oh, that was horrible. Very embarrassing as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that just did not work out very well. <laughs> Sarah, I know you said you've been doing this just for a short time, but I know for myself, it seems when I was real young, mm -hmm. I'd always collect little things I'd find in the woods, little pieces of bone or teeth. Or oh, yeah. yeah did definitely. you find that too when you were a kid? Yeah, I did. And uh, it was mostly for me, it was uh, uh, rocks that would attract me. I don't know what it was about these rocks, but I would find certain rocks and there's just something very special about them. And then uh, I kind of moved on to feathers for a while and then I moved on to bones and claws and teeth. But I've kept all of that stuff even though we've moved, you know, several times and I just have big boxes, like big cigar boxes just full of all this beautiful things I would find out in the woods. Well, you already hit my question. <laughs> no, we didn't. Neil was trying. Neil was Neil. trying to ask a question a minute ago. Yeah, go ahead. Anybody has questions? Well, I was just wondering where you started and what was your first. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think about what like, my first ones was. I think it was mainly the ca the tail keychains that I was. Uh, I thought, well, that'd be something kind of cool that I would wear. So I started wearing it, and then I had friends that were saying, oh, well, you know, that's really cool. Where could I get one? I'm like, well, I made it. So they were kind of interested in that, and um, it was, I started with wearing a red fox tail, and it felt very, very natural to wear a tail on my side, which was kind of funny. Um, but I've been doing it ever since. I've just always worn a tail around, so... I think it's kind of become a part of my identity, partly because people associate it with nature punk and partly because it's just, you know, a part of a, a part of who I am, really. Do you find do you that you cycle through different tiles or do you normally use fox? Um, right now, I'm actually, I have two tails that I wear. I wear a black wolf tail with uh, like silver hairs kind of uh, scattered in it. It's a really, really beautiful tail. And um, I also have a coyote tail that I wear. I don't really wear foxtails very much anymore, but I think the coyote tail is probably my favorite. Real quick, is anybody else getting an echo? Yeah, I'm getting an echo from tiny Sarah. bit. For me, I'm almost yeah. briefly. It seems huh. gone now, though. Okay. <laughs> it was there. Now it's not anymore. That's okay. <laughs> so you said you were in the dorms. What are you going to school for? Um, environmental studies. Um, really, I'm just hoping to come up with some new and possibly workable ways for humans to live more peacefully with nature. And, um, you know, like I said, to me, nature is God, and 
if I can do something to help preserve it, that's what I want to do with my life. So how much longer do you have? Uh, this is my first year. I'm just finishing up. And uh, so far, so good. But, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a long four years. But, you know, that's how it goes. It's college. You're talking yeah. about it like it's a prison sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in for another four years. <laughs> Well, in some ways it is. Kind of depends on which classes you're taking. Right now, I've got some really interesting classes. Uh, I have a, a adventure-based therapy class, which is pretty sweet, and a, cool. a sculpture class, and a metalworking class, and I also have a writing class. So, yeah. Cool. Now, we all talked about the animals that do say, or that have a voice and say where they want to go. Have you ever gotten something that is, I don't want to say bad energy, but not exactly the most pleasant to work with? Um, actually, the Black Wolf headdress that is on my uh, Etsy account right now, um, when I first got it, it had a huge, uh, like, big hole in the muzzle, probably from uh, either a really bad skinning job or something that happened when they were fleshing the skin. And... Um, I was totally convinced that I would not be able to use it for anything except perhaps to, you know, cut it up and part it out, but I really didn't want to do that. So I tried to make it work, and surprisingly it did, but during that whole point while I was working with it, it was almost like a battle between me and this wolf and getting this, you know, headdress to work. But when I was done, I felt like I learned a lot from that wolf, mainly about, you know, patience and perseverance. So... It was a learning experience as well. <laughs> so it ended up to turn out to be a good thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's only been one other situation when I've had something that I just thought was, you know, it, it almost seemed like what I would consider evil to me. But that one also turned out being a very good situation as well. Um, the very first skull that I ever had was a deer skull, and I called him Mr. Skull, simply because I didn't have a more creative name for him. And uh, I found him at an antique store, but he was completely covered with, you know, dirt and mud and all this nasty stuff. And uh, the first night that I brought him home, I had him sitting on my desk. And I fell asleep that night, and I had this dream, kind of a bit of a nightmare, really, that I was walking around in this, uh, uh, like, a marsh. And I came to the top of this hill that was up above the marsh, and I was looking out over this muddy lake, and all of a sudden the surface of the water started to look like it was boiling and this huge deer stepped up out of the mud and started walking across it toward me and I woke up and I was rather freaked out because I was staring directly at a deer skull sitting on my desk and I thought that it was still part of the dream and it was getting closer and closer but then I realized no 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 that's Mr. Skull <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> the next day I took him outside and I cleaned him off and ever since then, I've not really had any true nightmares. So he's kind of like my uh, my dream skull, really. Okay, we got a awesome. question. We got a question from the chat room that's kind of relevant to the current conversation. Yeah, um, sure. Do, do you give him, do you give nicknames to all your inventory and get a feel for their personalities, or um, you know, what's your take on that? Um, sometimes I do. It kind of depends. Most of the time I try not to, especially if it's something that I'm going to sell because then I start feeling really attached to it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I do believe that almost everything that I have in here has a personality. And for me, you know, a big part of having a personality is having at least a title, if not, you know, a name. And, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Each and every single one has their own, you know, they just have a feel to them. Good luck getting some of them to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <clears throat> a while ago, I was driving home, and I'm past a dead, what was it? Um, Agnes? No, 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 not Agnes. I'm past a dead um, raccoon or something on this kind of road. And as we often do, I could feel that the spirit of the animal was still hovering around the animal, a bit confused and disoriented. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out mentally and said, dude, it's okay. Hop on board. I'll take you somewhere until you want to go 
find your way in the wild again. Mm-hmm. So I'm driving along, and there is the spirit of a dead badger, raccoon, something in the car with me. And we're, we're driving along, and <clears throat> um, um, Snooze calls me. <clears throat> um, and oh, that guy! I told her. Yes, I told her. <laughs> I'll be yeah. home in okay. about half an hour. I'm here and there. And how do I get this animal to shut up? <laughs> he, was, he was the spirit of the animal, of course, not its physical presence. Just his spirit was was in the was in the floorboard of the car yammering on endlessly about every bloody thing he could think of, talking about the weather and talking about his feet and talking about on the age and talking about his best friends and talking about the trees. And, oh, my God, he wouldn't shut up. <laughs> that was a raccoon. Yeah, I remember raccoon, that guy. Yes. He, cro- he crops up every once in a while now, and he's still – it's he's like Pillsy from Foamy the Squirrel. Yes. I swear yes. to God, he's, <laughs> he's like Pillsy. Oh. And Festus hates him. I've got a, I've got a mule deer skull <laughs> that's been with me for quite a while that is – according to himself, God's gift to humanity and everything else. And he'll drop kick him. He can't. He, it's yeah. like, would you tell it to shut the hell up? <laughs> and it, there, there's a lot of anthropomorphizing there. They don't actually say it in those words or whatever, right. but it just, that's, yeah. I, I tell you people. Reach out with your mind, you can feel mm-hmm. what they're trying to communicate. Yeah. Who has to reach out? Good Lord. <laughs> oh, they reach out to you. Hi. Yeah, seriously. Different times we've been driving somewhere cross country, whichever, you know, and um, we passed roadkill on the way, and you might realize after a while that there's a great horned owl, um, two raccoons, a deer, um, touch in the back seat sharing popcorn and there's a turkey vulture riding along the hood of the car as well going wee like that chick on Titanic you know <laughs> it's a, a very very amusing mental image of a turkey oh, vulture crikey. sitting at the top of the Titanic <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> well they would they're, they're like one of the only birds that I, I bless their hearts. I love like, hogs, falcons, and owls. I love them to death, but most of them are dumb as a bag of hammers. <laughs> Turkey vultures are brainy. They're so smart, and they have a completely different mentality, you know, for stuff like that. I don't get as I don't get as many of them because they don't seem to have a personal agenda to take care of, or they're like, okay, yeah, time to go now, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But if you if you live in an area with a lot of deer, the one that I've found across the board that they really, really like, if you're familiar with Rush, off of the test for Echo CD, there's a song called Totem. Mm-hmm. And coincidentally, it does have some of Neil Peart's existential spiritual stuff in it. But the drum line is, well, okay, it's Neil Peart, but... It's a good song. It's not it really only is, fabulous. Yeah. I can play. I, I have anywhere from maybe a handful to forty head of deer running around here at any particular time, depending on who's decided to come by. Because this place is Grand Central. It's anything that comes through gets an open invitation. You know, you're welcome to stick around, hang around. You know, whatever you want to do, as long as you don't get in anybody else's crap or rain on anybody else's parade. You know, and we don't eat family members. <laughs> And they come through, they drop in, they leave, they stick around, whatever. But if I'm out in the car, several of them do like, do seem to like to go ride. And if I crank, there's a couple of songs that if I crank them up and I'm out on open highway, not only do I find myself with a car full of animals, all apparently, you know, enjoying the music, There'll be ghost deer that will just come out of the woods and run alongside the car (laughs) for the duration of the song. And then they're like, okay, fine, it's over with you. And then they'll go fade back into the woods. So Mm -hmm. give it a shot sometime. I've got a running study on that that I've gotten other people. I like to lab wrap my UPGs. So if if you don't mind, 
give that a shot sometime and let me know what kind of results you get out of it because I am keeping track. All right. I know what I the UPG is. I, I, and which song I, is I, I, uh, Strangely enough, um, Totem by Rush. It's on the okay. Test for Echo CD. If you don't have it, contact me and I'll direct you to where you can get a copy okay. without having to go in debt. Um, <laughs> It, there's one or the two UPG other songs, is? too. I've... Hmm? What, Miles? I know what the UPG is? You know the phrase UPG refers to? Sarah? Uh, no. Okay. The UPG is unverified or unverifiable personal gnosis. Hmm. I believe this. I can't physically prove it that this is a real event, but I believe this. Mm-hmm. Like, if I, I give, if I believe, say, that a, that, um, these, um, that these spirit of an old friend of mine who is imparted now is an apostle and doll next to my front door. I believe that the spirit of my friend is in the porcelain. I cannot in any way prove Mm -hmm. that she is in the porcelain doll, but it's my UPG that she is there. Mm -hmm. I suppose that would be kind of like uh, how I just feel certain things from certain animals, and I can't really explain why I feel that, nor can I really show anybody else what it is, but I do feel it. That's a UPG. Okay, that's so an that UPG. I like, and I like to, I like to make guinea pigs out of mine, just because it's kind of a thing of no, I can't prove it to anyone. But if I consistently get the same results, or if I get other people that tend to be fairly like, fairly reliable with psychometrics that get similar or comparable mm. results, then I've got something. So yeah. you know, if you tag me, tag me later, I'll send you a link to it if you don't have it or whatever. And I'd really, really love some feedback. Because it's hard to get oh, people to, to talk about doing that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a question for Sarah. Yeah, sure. Have you seen in museums and things, you've seen preserved thousands of, like, bats and frogs and mice, these little tiny, tiny, intricate bones and such. Mm-hmm. Um, once these um, smallest animal you've worked with, and how do you preserve bones that small, that carefully? Or do um, I worked with a starling once that I had found in a wood pile, and all of the bones were there because there was no wind or anything to actually blow them away. But what was unusual uh, about the whole situation was because it had been in the middle of a wood pile, everything was kind of like smushed together, but all the bones were still held in place like on the back side of the skin. So the only parts that were not actually very well preserved were the uh, tips of the wing bones. But um, I just kind of left that one the way it was. You know, it didn't really need to be uh, cleaned or anything. Um, it was perfectly right. preserved. It was almost like mummified, really. But um, other than that, I've worked with, uh, m- like, uh, mouse skulls and mink skulls and that kind of stuff. And they do have very, very thin bones. So one of the big things about that is just uh, if you are going to clean them, don't soak them too long. Yeah, they get mushy. I right. did a frog, mm-hmm. and I actually did have all of the skeleton because I uh, it was I lost one of my gold tree frogs, and mm-hmm. where I buried her, I didn't realize that leaves had fallen over it, and the the skeleton was completely intact. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I knew was just to try to cover it with like a resin mm-hmm. to try to hold it in one piece, mm-hmm. and she didn't want to be kept. Yeah, the ungrateful little bitch. <laughs> so I wound up just having to, I, all that all of it was wasted. I wound up having to just bury her again, but it's it, it requires more patience than I usually have. I don't think I've I've only ever done bird skulls. I don't think I could do an entire do a whole small bird mm-hmm. without messing it up. Yeah, well, it definitely takes you know like a lot of experience and that kind of stuff. And I don't really have very much experience working with the the very, very small things. I generally prefer working with larger stuff. Personally, I feel very connected to uh, predatory animals, especially big cats. And, um, you know, if I can work with anything like that, that's definitely something that I will go for. We had a question from Miss Lamiko of Lamiko's Wiccan Podcast. Do you work with 
have you or have you ever done things for people from their past pets? Um, I've worked with shed fur, like from the the uh, animal which is deceased. But uh, I think most people today generally prefer to have their uh, pets either buried or cremated. So there really aren't very many remains. Um. Normally when I'm working with fur, I'll uh, do it in like a little curio bottle so that the fur is protected and preserved inside. But so that if you want, you can still take the cork off and actually feel the fur. Hmm. Okay. That works. Mm-hmm. I, I need to actually do something a little bit dressier. with. I've got fur and whisker samples and claw samples from most of the ones that ha- that have been pet you know companion animal members of the household but mm-hmm. i'm kind of skanky because i've got them in plastic film canisters mm-hmm. i really should get some nice jars yeah I, th- I think it's nice to have them in you know like a, a small jar that you can you know always just look into and when the light catches them mm-hmm. it's almost like they're speaking to you really it's just beautiful to have them up there on a windowsill or something mm-hmm. have that's, you a, ever that's had- a good idea sorry have sam you go ahead had where go ahead sam it's I just cool, felt it anyway. Go ahead. You sure? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's and I I, always, I wonder if you've ever um if you guys ever um spun. Um, you mean like wool um, kind of stuff? Well, you could do it with any kind of um, any kind of fiber, really. Any kind of fiber, like people or people. Hair tends to get brittle after time. Um, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of really cool old Victorian crafts of, of preserving hair and making jewelry. Yeah, out. like morning yeah, morning jewelry that they used to do. Yeah. But yeah. Um, with the, depending on what species of animal you're dealing with, you can spin them. And I only say that because I do a lot of fiber art stuff. Mm-hmm. But you can make little little wall hangings. Um, hmm. I know I saw, like for memorials, uh, a woman was doing it with human uh, remains after they were cre- cremated, but she was... Uh, painting kind of impressionistic pictures she would sit with the family and kind of talk about the person and and she kind of get a feel of of what this person was like and kind of do a painting and then she would use uh i forget what kind of glue she would use but she'd infuse um the glue with the 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 cremated remains of of the loved one and then you know have it as a piece of artwork Mm. that's too cool absolutely beautiful really interesting way of doing it seems very neat Google foo it and see if I can get a link for you guys. But it was, um, I know it turned a lot of people off, but I thought it was really an interesting memorial that you can have, you know. Yeah, and even for the family, you know, just sitting there and talking with them as the artist is doing this painting is, you know, a very good way for them to really come to terms with all of it, you know, just talking about the person after they've passed. But I always wanted to know, like, to maybe try, um, instead of waiting for a loved one of mine to die, uh, you know, if there was a remains of uh, an animal and and try to incorporate that into uh you know a, a small uh you know wall hanging or something in a frame or mm-hmm. and and see about using that especially um i know i i have some pieces that are old and falling mm-hmm. apart i'm trying to find a way to preserve them maybe in a different state mm-hmm. so that they can stay yeah um Normally what I do is, like, when I get a, a full pelt or, you know, even just the tails, um, I will brush them with the a, a wire tooth a dog brush. You know, it just makes them really fluffy and gets all the mats and gnarls out. And um, I'll usually save the fur from that, um, mainly because I toss it out the window so birds can make nests with it. Um, but I love I that. Have, I have <laughs> considered um, actually giving it to somebody who spins yarn to make, you know, like wolf hair yarn. How cool would that be? So that's something that you could probably do with, uh, like, uh, if you have, like, an old fox stole that's fallen apart or something like that. So. Have you ever had um, pieces that, as they're about to be sold or as they're talking to you wanting to sell them, the piece itself says no? Um, I don't think I've come across that situation quite yet. Um. I have had situations where people have, you know, asked, hey, can I buy this, you know, and they'll point to something, and it just does not fit along with that person. So politely, I'll just say, well, here's something else that you could, you know, that you could try, and I think that this will be better for you. So I've never really had the situation after somebody has purchased something. 
mainly, you know, a lot of people, they like to actually talk to me before they buy something, which is, you know, it's good for me and it's good for them as well. But, um, yeah, I never had that situation yet. Yeah, those are fun. It's, Mm -hmm. I get a lot of stuff in my booth that I'm not, I'm not doing an Etsy store anymore because I just didn't have the time to maintain it the way that my group wanted me to maintain it. Yeah. Um, but I get, I do shows and stuff and I get people at the booth sometimes that the, the piece picks them. Yeah. And that kind of winds up determining how it goes and that sort of thing. And I've made some deals with people just because what I had was like, nope, I'm going with them. Your Mm -hmm. business agenda is not my problem. Mm -hmm. And I've had a couple people that have been, um, well, I'll give you this for or I'll give you that for and get really offended because I said no. Mm-hmm. And I've I've even had people do the, well, I can hear the spirit and the goddess and the goddess is telling me that that animal wants to come with me. And I was like, that's fine, sweetheart, but that animal is telling me that if you don't get out of the booth right now, I'm going to be forced to pick you up and throw you like a javelin. <laughs> and it, yeah, it's. You don't, I'm not going to tell somebody, no, I'm sorry, you can't buy that one because it says you stink and it can't stand you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But sometimes that's the only thing that gets through people's heads is just to offend them to the point where they don't want it anymore. Yeah. I never had to deal with that one yet, but I'm I'm sure it's going to happen eventually. You know, I've only been doing this for about a year and a half, so. (laughs) Hmm. What was your first pet? Hmm? Sorry, Miles, what, what was, was that? Your first, no, what was your first pet? My first pet was a tabby cat named Smokey, but at the time I was not able to pronounce Smokey, so we called it Moki. So we <laughs> had a tabby cat named Moki. <laughs> and then a Fraggle Rock. <laughs> <laughs> My cat was the most tolerant cat I have probably ever met. <laughs> And um, my sister, she used to, you know, snuggle and pet it all the time, and Moki didn't really appreciate all the attention. But even at that young of an age, I understood that cats, they just want to be, you know, petted. They don't want to be squished, and they don't want to be snuggled with all the time. So that cat, you know, kind of followed me around the house as if, you know, okay, I know you. I know that you're going to pet me nice, and you're not going to hold me upside down or, you know... (laughs) <laughs> Pull on my yeah. whiskers. Look, so. it's a play toy. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so what do you what do you do when you're not working with all of the dead animals? Um, one of my big things is I absolutely love hiking. I love being outside. Um, I kayak when I can, and um, I do other jewelry work as well. You know, not just with animal parts and that kind of thing. Um, mainly right now though, it's just school work and that sort of stuff. But um, I do a lot of photography. Photography is, like, my huge passion. And it's also been able to get me really close to a lot of animals and that kind of stuff. Um, I actually recently got an email from the curator of the High Desert Museum in, uh, there's a place out in Bend, Oregon. And um, cool. he had seen some of the photos that I'd taken of the, the links that they have there. And... He said, hey, I saw your photos. I really enjoyed them. I was wondering if you wanted to come and photograph, you know, some of our other animals and other exhibits. And um, I said, yeah. But, you know, that thing has definitely uh, uh, opened up a lot of opportunities for me to be close to animals as well. So photography is a huge, huge passion as well. And if people were looking for your work or looking to contact you, where would they go? Um, I have a Flickr account, which is, uh, you know, almost strictly my photography, and that is www.flickr, that's uh, F-L-I-C-K-R, dot com slash little lioness zero nine, all one word. Just typing that in the show notes so I remembered it. All right. Trying to think. I think we're all working on about a half hour. <laughs> no, <we're> okay. <laughs> How do you explain to little kids what you do? Um. Oh, that's a hard one. Or have you had uh, to? I've had to explain that uh, 
mostly just when I have a family coming to visit or something like that. Like I have a younger cousin and uh, she came and that was at a point when I mostly had skulls and I think that that was kind of hard for her to digest. But, um, you know, I just explained that this is what it's all like, you know, underneath all of that, uh, uh, you know, fur and flesh. And this is what makes the animal work, you know. I think after she heard that, she was a little more eager to learn, you know, and see the way that the teeth come together and the way that the jaw works and, you know, how wide the, the lower jaw opens from the upper jaw. And it was just kind of neat for her, you know. But uh, it's a lot easier explaining it to uh, kids when I have the fur because fur is soft and it's something that they can relate to, you know, almost like a stuffed animal. So, you know, it's it's kind of a, a much easier on me. But Has your family generally been pretty accepting of a lot of the stuff that you do? Um, I think at first my mom was sort of freaked out that I was working, you know, with like animal parts and bones and, you know, she was just worried that it was, you know, all dirty and nasty and that I was going to get fleas from the pelts. But of course that's completely untrue <laughs> because fleas, they drink blood, there's no blood in pelt. So, you know, once she got a little more used to it, I think that she was totally fine and it, it just took her a little while. But now that I'm in college, I'm, you know, rather away, so... I don't think she really needs to needs to worry about it so much anymore, and I'm sure she's pretty relieved about that. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you've been surprisingly quiet for this whole whole time. I got nothing else to add, um, <laughs> other than the chat room conversation, which started at animal art, went to donuts. We were talking about geology for a little while. We went back to donuts. And way back in the beginning, there was a question that, that we never got asked or answered. No, it's no fair. And um, you know, basically, the the question was, um, you know, that to a lot of people, the whole, um, you know, someone being some no, not someone, something being killed ethically is uh, kind of important to them. Mm -hmm. And they were they were wondering, you know, how you know if someone asked to to show that, how exactly would you go about showing that? you know, the source of these pelts and so forth was, you know, it was, uh, uh, when it died, it was died, it died in a somewhat ethical way. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's always kind of a hard deal to, to work through because, of course, the fish and game department, it's not like they get a print off, you know, a receipt for you and say, here, you know, they, they just don't work like that. They're not a store, you know. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, 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 this is our organic <laughs> section. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's a lot easier with the stuff, uh, you know, from antique stores or that kind of thing. And uh, most often when I'm working with animals that are roadkill, they show obvious signs of it, you know. And uh, that is one of the big things as well. But um, that's part of the reason that I really do like to get stuff from antique stores because, you know, there's really no way to fake that, you know, true vintage smell. And there's really no way to fake, you know, a <laughs> not something. True vintage <laughs> smell. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, that's, that's just where I get a lot of my stuff. And, you know, like I said, I love antique shopping. So, you know, going to be doing that for a while. <laughs> now, I know on your Etsy you have about the sites for things like the wolves. Can you explain a little bit of what the sites are and why they are important if you're looking for yeah. not only your site but anybody's site? Um, you mean like CITES, the CITES? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, CITES is the Convention in International Trade of Endangered Species, and of course it's just put in place to protect the animals, and uh, you know, that's a huge, huge deal, because currently the um, annual income for illegal wildlife trade um, is actually above human trafficking, so it is a huge, huge problem, and that's, you know, the main reason that places like CITES exist, and their job is essentially to um, regulate import and export of animal parts, you know, from the United States and all other participating countries. And um, when I get a permit for something, that's just to say that, yes, this was legally obtained, um, you know, here's where it comes from, and, um, you know, it was imported at such and such a date, signed by such and such a person, to say that, yeah, this is truly legit. So, all of the wolf parts that I have come with a CITES permit. And that does not mean that they can be exported to other states or, I mean, to other countries, but they can be exported anywhere in the United States. 
the, there's a whole separate set of laws and a whole separate set of permits for international shipping, which is why I just don't offer it for most of my products. And we just had a comment in the chat room. Uh, maybe you could take a photo of roadkill before and after treatment, sort of like before and after the makeover. Yeah, that would actually be something hmm. that I think would be really cool. The only problem that I would have, though, is that I do realize a lot of people are quite squeamish. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure everybody would really appreciate seeing that. But um, that is definitely something that I could, you know, that I could do. And then if somebody would want to request seeing a photo of a roadkill animal before I have it, um, you know, that's something that I could probably probably offer as an email only type thing. <laughs> it's really actually a good idea to document if you have a roadkill that you didn't get from fish and game or from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, I take pictures of anything that I pick up that's mm -hmm. a roadkill. Even if it's not something, you know, that they normally care about. Because yeah. I have had two people call the police and tell them that I was torturing and doing horrible things to people's pets in my oh, backyard. Oh, boy. And I, I had one neighbor that was quite insistent that I must go to jail because you know, she called the cops twice. Uh, insisting that I was torturing and dismembering dogs I had stolen from other people or something in my oh. backyard. And even if they're really, really disgusting, I take pictures because by usually by the time I get them, the only thing that I'm still using is the bone. I rarely ever have a pelt that I, that can recycle Yeah, and yeah, is, because, because of the age. And once it's bone, I, it, it boggles the mind the number of even wildlife and game people that I could show a groundhog skull to with nice big carving teeth coming out of the front of it. And, and they have no idea what it is. They they like, well it looks big enough to be a dog, but it you know, it's too big to be a cat. Oh boy. And I, and I'm sitting there going, Oh God. So yeah. actually it's I it's not a bad idea to document everything you pick yeah. up. Like, so, so far, um, when it does come to me, like, collecting roadkill and that kind of stuff on my own, um, never did it in my parents' car because my mom always drove a Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I have had friends, and, you know, we've been on our road trips or just going somewhere or something like that, and I'd be like, oh, 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 dude, dude, dear, can we please stop? Can we please stop? And, of course, my friends all think I'm absolutely insane, but they go along with it. And... Um, <sighs> In those cases, I'd actually do keep a journal of, you know, like all the stuff that I find and where I find it and when. And, you know, probably not as uh, uh, good as pictures, but, you know, it's still something. And it is something that I do, you know, just for my own personal records as well. You know, just to say, okay, well, if I find a roadkill deer in this area and I find one another, you know, two or three miles down, it's, you know, sufficient to say that there's a very healthy deer population in the area. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's just something good to keep in mind just for me, you know. But, uh, yeah, it also does help with the, if did come across any kind of a legal problem. Man, that sucks that that happened. I'm really sorry about that. Well, uh, you know, it's just, there. Pe yeah, people can be, people can be really crazy. Yeah. And anything that smacks of something that's a little different, I mean, I've, I've had drivers stop on the side of the road and I had one guy actually get out of his car and start dialing 911 because I was getting a, um, I think it was a skunk. Oh, my. I was getting a skunk out of the road. And I turned and looked at him and I said, honey, this thing's flat. It's dead. <laughs> All I'm going to do is put it over there in the brush and cover it with some leaves. And he actually got back in his truck, rolled the window up or whatever, and said, stay back. Oh, boy. Like I was doing. It, and I've had a number of people stop on the side of the road and get really, really irate because they see me mucking about with a roadkill. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I've, I've seen just gotten it. Them. True. I've seen it. <laughs> and I'm like, you're kind of, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, you can't enjoy driving past this every day. Why don't you just shut up and let me get on with it? Yeah. So, it's yeah, I've gotten to the point where camera and documentation is my buddy. Yeah. But there's also yeah. those. But there's also those people who work airport customs checking in plant specimens. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. That, that's a whole other topic for a whole other <laughs> subject sometime. And I can't tell about that on something that's going to go out on the air because that will get me arrested. That's uh, true. Okay. In that case, in that case, delete the last 15 seconds. Okay. Yeah, that actually probably needs to go bye-bye because if I ever publish that, it's going to be under a pseudonym just so I can make fun of TSA and Homeland Security without going to jail. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just about to say, it is hard for some people to understand, you know, this whole concept of, like, working with dead stuff. And I think, you know, generally speaking, there's a whole, you know, negative, you know, look at when people say, oh, yeah, it's some roadkill. Partly just because people, you know, they see roadkill on the side of the road and they think it looks absolutely disgusting. But personally, you know, I think once the bones are processed, there's hardly any difference between, you know, a roadkill animal and one that was bought from the fish and game department because it was confiscated from, you know, somebody that shot it without a license. And, you know, I think that's just part of the problem is that people don't really understand that the finished product is all the same. Well, it, it, we have a, we have a really, really unhealthy culture around death in Western civilization. Anyway, people <laughs> kind of have been taught to treat death as something unnatural Mm -hmm. and something that is always bad. I mean, admittedly, the parts that actually render you dead are usually pretty unpleasant, and that's not anything anybody really wants to go through. But it is going to happen to everybody. Mm -hmm. And treating it as something that's horrifically morbid and that somehow something is wrong with you if you don't pretend that death doesn't exist... I find mm-hmm. to be very unhealthy just all on its own. Yeah. And, and the, Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's cool. That, that was pretty much it. Okay. Well, I was just, uh, um, a few years ago, I was in an APR class, and uh, we had to choose a concentration, you know, which is something that we base a body of work off of, like a theme or a subject or something like that. And I chose Memento Mori. Um as a photography project and um while doing it, it that really really came to light this whole idea that you know a lot of people just don't really understand that death is literally a part of life and that from the moment we're born we're headed toward you know the end and mm-hmm. if we don't accept that then you know how are we going to learn to live life to the fullest so yeah it's, you know, it's very it's one-sided mm-hmm. and i think the other thing that, that people run into is that in addition to that We've become so urbanized and so removed mm-hmm. from the natural world. It, it There's a lot of people that you say wild animals, and they automatically think either it's going to attack me or it has diseases. Mm-hmm. And it's, of course, it's dead. It's not going to attack you. But the idea that everything that's on the outside of the fence is still bad or, you know, needs to stay on the outside of the fence, and that people who, well, I'm gonna look, at the, look at the attitude that urbanites have had against rural people for, what, centuries, thousands of years. Yeah. That, you know, people that get down and dirty with the natural world or with, live, you know, livestock and that kind of thing or whatever, obviously are unevolved, unenlightened, you know, lesser barbaric people. Mm-hmm. And that attitude still prevails, and it, it bleeds over into into that kind of thing of that's the other. That's supposed to stay on the outside of the fence. That's not mm-hmm. supposed to come in here where we're at. Yeah. If you want to get all existential about it, you know. it's Personally, I'd rather be on the outside of the fence with some of my dead guys. They're a lot more fun to hang around with. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's kind of an a unusual thing. Um, like, uh, when I first came to uh, college, I had a roommate. And... Um, her mom had worked on a Native American reservation, so she was used to being around dead stuff and that kind of thing, and she was very accepting of it, and, you know, I really, really appreciated having her for a roommate, but uh, a friend of hers moved in down the hall, so she went to, you know, go live with her friend, and um, after that, uh, I just kind of thought about it for a while, and I'm like, I really don't see myself getting that lucky again as to have a roommate like uh, Kelsey, so... I'm just going to go ahead and get myself the single room and, you know, just not have to worry about it because I could see that causing a lot of problems. And, you know, part of that simply is the fact that people just are not used to, you know, living around death. And it's something I do every day, so I don't really see it as, you know, such a strange deal. And, 
you know, I live a very happy life. It's not like I'm, you know, weird, morbid person who's, you know, sitting in the corner crying all the time. I absolutely enjoy everything about, you know, my existence and, you know, being around death. That's just part of it. I know that. that help. Sorry, what? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I know that um, my other half and I, we work with bones here and there and um, I do a lot with feathers and it can be really funny sometimes. He has a beautiful knife mm-hmm. that he did the bone the bone handle. And when people realize that it is bone, half the time he has to catch it because they drop it. It's like, ooh, that's bone. I don't want to touch it. Ooh, it's how can you stand to work with that? And it's, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it's bone. You've yeah. got some as well. Yeah. <laughs> that does seem kind of like a strange thing to me that like people will freak out when they see me wearing a tail and yet they're wearing leather shoes. The only thing that's a difference there is that your leather shoes don't have any fur on them, you know? Yeah, they it's, don't. It's, they don't think about it. Yeah, yeah, they don't think if it's far enough removed and they can't recognize. It's like it, that that whole thing about you know you shouldn't you you shouldn't hunt for deer or whatever you should buy your food at the supermarket where nothing has to be harmed to get it i was just like yeah right. i've actually yeah. i've actually yeah. known <laughs> i've known people that actually think like that yeah oh, and well. it's that it's the the whole thing of it is is if it's removed enough that it's not recognizable then it's okay you mm-hmm. can do say you can sail majestically down that river in egypt right and enjoy the breeze and don't have to think about what it might smell like. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm against hunting for fun. But yeah. if the animal is actually getting used, I don't see a problem with it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, those guys that go out and have a couple beers and shoot things. Yeah, yeah that's horse no. crap. I'm, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, if you were going to stop something's life because for your use, you owe it to it to do that from a spirit of appreciation and gratitude Mm -hmm. and quite frankly i'd just as soon punch a trophy hunter's teeth down his throat as look at him because i consider that to be a i I have no i have no problem with gratuitous violence at all i mean it's good exercise you burn (laughs) calories but it's to me that that whole idea of shooting something just to prove you could hit it Mm -hmm. or even just looking at something and saying, you know, I'd like your head on my wall, <laughs> is the ultimate form of ethnocentric arrogance. And yeah. I quite frankly think they should be hung on a wall somewhere for a while and see how it feels like. Now, I had, I get most of my deer bone from a guy that processes for hunters. He does about 300 a season. Mm-hmm. And since he refu- he will not process deer meat or process a deer for anyone who comes in and says, well, I want you to save this or I want you to save that. Mm-hmm. Um, because he, he doesn't do trophy hunters at all and processes strictly for meat, which mm-hmm. means I can go up there and get all the heads and legs I want and tails. Mm-hmm. And I, I could go get a bunch of pelts if I could process them. Yeah. But he himself is a hunter, and he has several... Um, European mounts and taxidermy heads up in his shop. Mm -hmm. All of them have a plaque under them with a name on it and a date. He doesn't have them up as trophies to crow over. As -hmm. far as he's concerned, they are a record of how he has fed his family during times when money was very bad. Yeah. Yeah. As far as he's concerned, he, for, for someone who's a diehard Christian, he almost approaches them at a level of ancestor veneration without mm-hmm. even really knowing what he's doing. And yeah. I like him for it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's awesome. Definitely something I could appreciate. I have some friends that live out in uh, Wyoming, and they live like way, way out in the middle of nowhere. And um, the husband of the family, um, he hunts uh, pronghorn antelope, and he hunts uh, mule deer. And his wife is actually the one that processes all the meat and that kind of stuff. And um, we went over there once, and the entire time that we were staying in their house, all of the meat that we ate was from the animals that he had killed. And 
it was a very, you know, a very uh, rewarding feeling, really, to be able to, you know, partake in eating an animal that we knew had not suffered in a slaughterhouse and that we knew was being yeah. completely used. Anybody that thinks that a deer that takes a bullet to the head or a throat shot dies more humanely than anything that goes through a slaughterhouse, I want them to take a little trip with me. Yeah, and we can put I, we can we can put that attitude to rest very quickly unless they're just abysmally stupid. Yeah. My, well, thankfully, whole, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say that my whole thing is hunting will be a sport when the animals can fire back. <laughs> See, I don't have a I don't have a problem with that at all either. But if you've ever actually been out and, um. I, I know people that have been gored by bucks. Um, white-tailed deer aren't... Mule deer are actually pretty intelligent. White-tailed deer have not convinced me that... Uh, look, I'm sorry, guys. I've got fussing going over here on the white's altar. White-tailed deer are not the sharpest tools in the shed. <laughs> and when the males are in rut or just when they've decided that they feel like being Miller, Mr. Billy Badass because they do they they do all operate from the premise that they are oh my god I'm I'm studly you know hung well mm-hmm. and they'll charge the most ridiculous things I know people who have had their vehicles go and charged by male deer um there what what and there was an elk that got trapped in a bunch of high tension wire and had to be cut down because he charged a spool of cable wire while they were pulling it. <laughs> it's I, d- d- deer hunting comes with it does come with its own risks, especially if you've got now I, I really love bow hunters because they have to get up close, they have to take a risk and with a bow shot you have you need to be good. Mm-hmm. Which if you're a good shot the deer never know it never knows really what hit it mm-hmm. and it's there, there's there's a whole other attitude there but yeah it's i i know somebody that went to the emergency room because a buck a buck charged him and got him and put him up and flipped him like a bull oh man yeah <laughs> oh man i mean uh, man we were over in colorado a while ago actually and we uh, saw a car that had been um the car had hit an elk and you could tell it had hit a bull elk because in the roof of the car, you could actually see where the tines had sunk through the metal in the roof of the car into the nice. car. The car. Yeah. Miles oh, got, oh. Miles had one mm. run out in front of a GI Metro and turn it into an accordion a couple yep. of years ago. And I have the skull and the pelt outside in a freezer mm-hmm. and it, he was probably about 180 pounder mm-hmm. and he's lucky it didn't come through the windshield because it's, it, they, they come through the windshield and kill people. It's a little tiny Geo Metro, little little roller skate on a lawnmower engine, and this buck in rut, it was in mid-October, I think, came charging out, and I know that at 12 in the morning, at um, the exact same second, both the deer and I said, Oh, crap! <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> That's part of the reason I'm glad that I don't drive around here, because we have so many deer in Ashland. It is absolutely insane. And they'll just go prancing across the road, and oh, yeah, we have, have no deer brain. jams, you know. It's it's just it's it's preposterous. They can yeah. they they're not they're not strategic thinking animals. <laughs> it's they're really not. I mean, okay, I, the mule mule deer, as far as I can tell, are smarter than whitetails, and I have to say that because I'm getting a ruckus over here. Now you can shut up and quit complaining. <laughs> um, I'm sorry that anybody that has this idea that you know, I, I I have had someone pop up and say. You know, I think it's horrible that you're doing this to these poor animals. You know, it's you know, or you're especially if they feel that I'm abusing their spirit somehow by doing this or whatever. I'm like, honey, try telling them to do something they don't want to do. I mean, heck, I can't even get them to shut up half the time. (laughs) I I, kind of agree with the white-tailed deer thing. Uh, We have a huge problem with that in the state of Pennsylvania. 
Yeah, you're right there. I, in the I, middle. I actually call it I, when, I, when I first got a, a truck. I I call it my deer killer because I, <laughs> I, I yeah. used to drive at night, and these animals are some of the dumbest animals you will see in the world. How they don't go extinct is beyond me. Oh wait, never mind. They reproduce like crazy. Breed like rabbits. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, and you. No, uh, I may be saying this to the wrong audience. I saw one explode one time. I thought that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had one run out in front of a friend of mine's car, and the only it it hit the uh, there was a high bridge in the middle of the hood. And that was the only thing that kept it from going through the windshield. But it kind of, when we hit, we were doing about 65 when we hit it. And, yeah, they they can do that on impact. Um, yeah, and yeah, it was we a had, to trail it We had it. to pull off because you couldn't see out of the windshield anymore. Oh, it's, man. Oh, <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. yeah all I saw out of the corner of my eye was this, like, red cloud. I'm like, that's not supposed to be there. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. That's like all Down these, here. All these, hmm? Go ahead, Miles. Yeah. That's like all these hunters who think that using um, high-velocity submachine guns to hunt deer is a oh, sport. Th- Do they really that, that's a waste of a gun. I mean, that, you go driving around really, the that, sooner or later that, you will hit one. To, well, that's... to I'm a phrase a comedian from some years ago, I forget who, but if you if you have to go hunting with an Uzi, Ugh. that's beef that's beef jerky in both noun and verb form. Oh my God. <laughs> I like that one. That that's not hunting. That's just some stupid idiot that wants to watch I things know. explode. My, I have a I have a sibling that does that kind of crap, and he tries to play all of this gun rights business or whatever. The little hook for the AK forty seven. I was like, no, stupid. You're supposed to get it made into sausage after you kill it, not <laughs> as you I, kill it. I support the right to arm bears. Something else I've learned, though, is a personal observation for me. That's why it's called personal. Um, is <clears throat> that I was out fishing with I know, and some friends, and we and we <clears throat> and we caught a um catfish, and they started different things, and I realized that. I cannot eat the flesh of an animal after I've looked into its eyes when it was alive. There's a connection made there in the living that I cannot eat the flesh after it's dead. I, it, uh, uh, you know? Well, that, I mean, that, you talking about that catfish that Bobby caught? Yeah. When we were up at Bobby's like, Jackie's, yeah. That one wasn't... <sighs> I like meat, I eat flesh, you know, venison, beef, but knowing that the ground beef that's in the grocery store shelf in the plastic used to be a cow, I'm okay with that. But if I had to look at the cow and then know that that same cow is on my plate, I probably couldn't eat that meal. Mm -hmm. There's a weird place there that sometimes is kind of hard to describe. Um, Okay, you've heard me talk about Native American um, folklore that states mm-hmm. that if you are a proper hunter and you are a decent hunter and you are a hunter of the material you were supposed to be to be worthy to eat. In other words, like not not just eat because you're supposed to eat like we do or whatever, because if you don't eat, you that might be the only meal you'll get all day or on the next couple of days and it's wintertime and you're going to starve. Mm-hmm. It's... The animal that you're hunting, which, I mean, it, it's really, it's fairly probably the most common with bear and deer, but the tradition goes, or the lore goes, that the totemic essence of that species, not deer or bear with a small D and B with a capital B and a D, steps into that place at that time and will offer themselves to a hunter so that they can live and that's the sacred space to be in it's a weird space to be in it's a 
I think people turn, one of the terms I've heard is horrible gift mm-hmm. or horrible mm-hmm. blessing or blessed horror or something along those lines because it, it can, it, it's, it's eerie and yet it's a, pro, it's a profound gift at the same time that something will do this for you. But mm-hmm. they slip back and forth across, across material and spirit a lot easier than we do. They don't have all of our baggage. Yeah. And when you've got, no, I don't think the animals that go into the slaughterhouses step into that space, which is one of the reasons why it, any piece of meat I come across, I might be the only person that actually thanks the spirit of whatever gave it up. Mm-hmm. But there, people that hunt in that frame of mind or in that spirit will run across that of of something bigger stepping into that space and it's a it's a it's sort of a sacred cosmic bargain and then the agreement is that you will give back when you go the same way not necessarily you know which it actually works out pretty good we consider ourselves at the top of the food chain yet we'll go to the lowest foundation of the food chain yeah so we complete a yeah. circle if unless you know unless we do something really stupid like you know have ourselves embalmed in wax or something and eventually we still will anyway <laughs> But there, that that's an it's an odd space to be in, especially if you're not looking for it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that you've ever been in that. I don't know that you've ever even gotten in a position to be in that space. But the catfish that Bobby had on the line was not it. That that wasn't an offering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I wouldn't be in him either. Mm. He needed to go back out. Yeah. So your your instinct there to me is accurate. <laughs> hey Sarah. Mhm. Um, if you could, what would you? Real, yeah, I'll try again. <laughs> what would you want to have happen to your flesh and bones when you're dead? Um, I think that the ideal situation would, well, a I would. Definitely want to be an organ donor, because if I can save somebody else's life in my death, then that, you know, is a very, very rewarding thing. And, you know, whatever is left of me, really, I think that I would rather just have it buried straight in the earth, you know, no coffin, no anything, just being able to... Green burial. Yes. Green burial. Yes. Just being Uh able to, you know, rejoin the earth, just become a part of it, that's what I would really like. Cool. Do you know Nora Cedarwind? I do not. Oh, yeah, I need to hook you up. She's so offered to would be adore under, her. She's offered oh, you guys totally show. need to have her on. You guys yeah. totally yes. need to have I, her I on have if you have. Information. Uh, yeah. She just doesn't like doing it around sound because everybody always talks around well, about death all right. the time. So. Yeah. It's, but April, May, yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, she would absolutely. She she's absolutely fantastic. She has a delivery and approach that people are not expecting when you're talking about what she's talking about. She mm-hmm. is an amazing woman. Uh, we actually did manage to interview her very briefly for our P- our PSG episodes, um, but actually, when I was busy dying and a uh, certain somebody didn't realize it, um, she was really <laughs> awesome, and I got to to hang out in the cabin water for a few hours, and she's just an awesome person. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So you you talked to her at PSG. Yep. Okay. Cool. Nope. That's I, that's where I ran into her and everything. And it's she's it's kind of cool and everything. Cause she's she's a death midwife. Um, she does what I do, except she's got a lot harder job because she actually has to deal with people. I get the cool ones. Yeah. And her she step she steps into a space that winds up being cross a crossroads and an opposite polarization mix all at the same time and has a very good sense of humor about it. So, yeah, God, you guys got to get her on the show. She's a blast. Yes, you should. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I so got speaking of... She doesn't, go ahead, email. she doesn't have an email, but I got her <laughs> phone number, so I'll, I'll give her a call. Cool. So speaking of PSG, Sarah, do you have any plans to, maybe after you're out of college, <laughs> maybe for extra cash here and there, do anything... Um, for festivals or group events? Um, I don't really know. I mean, I think it would be really, really cool if I could, you know, actually get uh, a booth at, like, our Saturday market or something like that. Um, you know, be an opportunity to meet new people, make new contacts, and just show people what I do. And, 
you know, so far in Etsy, it's worked, but I would much rather actually be able to talk with people one-on-one and, you know, actually see them hold the pieces before, you know, they pay for them and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. I don't really have many options considering the fact that I've been working online for this whole time. But, um, yeah, if I actually could get a booth at a market or a festival or something, I mean, we have, like, the uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival right here in Ashland, which I think would be a great opportunity. But, you know, it's just a matter of uh, figuring out how to go about doing that and then actually doing it. The, the PSG crowd would love your stuff. For them. I only ran across three people the whole week we were there, and we're talking about close to 1,000 people in attendance. Mm-hmm. Um, for the whole week, I only ran across three people that really had a, an issue with what I do. Mm-hmm. And one of them came to the class that I teach. And by the end of the class, she was coming up to the booth and petting and picking up the skulls and talking to them. And she just, I said, look, just go sit over in the corner and get acquainted with everybody. And you'll be fine. And by the end of the thing or whatever, she was up there asking them if any of them would honor her by going home with her, not asking me how much they were, but mm-hmm. asking them directly if any of them would honor her enough to go home with her. Yeah. So it, the PSG is a, is a great venue for that kind of thing. You do very well there. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. I sure you- definitely like that opportunity. What uh, Snooze was just describing sounds exactly like what I would really, really enjoy people doing. You know, people just asking, you know, I feel really connected questions. to this particular piece. Yeah. It, they, <laughs> they, draw, they draw an awesome group of people up there for the event Mm-hmm. And I, I did. It's one of the it's one of the few events that I do that I have people that come in the booth and will talk to the skulls or the bones before they come talk to me. Mm-hmm. And I love that. That's yeah. exactly yeah. what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really neat deal. Like it worked out well with uh, Amber and the headdress that she bought. I mean, it just seemed like everything just sort of came together, and. You know, that was like uh, maybe like the third or fourth time that that's actually happened with me online. And I think that it'd be a lot easier if I were actually making, you know, transactions with people who are actually there, you know, to see the items and that kind of thing. But, yeah. Yeah, it can be an interesting experience. I had a booth at a Pagan Pride Day in North Carolina, and I did feathers. um, I painted feathers down here. And just to see... When somebody picks up a piece that you've done and you can feel that it's, the only way I can explain it is it almost feels like it's cuddling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can understand that. So it's to to see them and to see them react to that connection is mm-hmm. absolutely wonderful. Mm-hmm. And it can be well worth, even if it, you know your first vending experience doesn't go well. The first time that happens at a vending can be well worth the whole time there. Yeah, yeah. That definitely makes a lot of sense, and I think that is something that I definitely want to uh, pursue. But, you know, it's just going to take a while. I think that, you know, part of my main thing is that selling the stuff online and that kind of thing, I feel kind of safe because I don't always have to worry about people, you know, saying, oh, like, oh, are you killing animals and that kind of stuff? And then I can, you know, calm myself down and I can reply in an intelligent manner. But I'm <laughs> sure I would have a much harder problem if somebody was getting right up in my face and saying it. And I think, you know, that's one thing that I might have an issue with if I were actually doing a vending thing around here. You know, Ashland, anywhere in the Northwest, really, uh, people are, you know, very, very uh, aware of the environment and, you know, ecosystems and animals. And, you know, everybody's, like, really, really anti fur and most of the food we get here is organic so you know i really really appreciate living at a place like this where everybody is just you know so in tune Jeez. with that kind of thing it's it's really that is a, yeah that's a far <sighs> cry from down here north I'm carolina really, really, the more i hear the more yeah. i'm like in oregon <laughs> <laughs> i it is a beautiful place too you're totally welcome down here <laughs> i really i really think that in I don't want to label North Carolina this way, but in this part of the South, it mm-hmm. people really do equate an ecologically conscious mindset with either ignorance, communism, or Satanism. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We've, yes. We've, we're, there, right. Anti anti intellectualism. Yeah. And that sort of thing is very prevalent. 
and you have a lot of people that are still loathing the hippie movement. Mm-hmm. And as far as they're concerned, environmentalist equals hippie equals no good, dirty, antisocial, godless, right. something, yeah. another, something, another. Fill in the blank with the derogatory term du jour. Mm-hmm. I've, had so people say, I've had people say that it is against Christ to recycle. What? Okay. Now yes. What? Really yeah, it's, yes, yes, yes. Oh it's goodness. it's a fallen earth theory thing. They the people around here that practice fallen earth theory, which you know the puritanic, it's it's a puritan leftover. The whole idea that the world is given over to that the world was given over to Satan and the world is fallen and the world is evil, and that you're not supposed to appreciate or have any kind of attach any importance to anything of the physical material world. You're only supposed to keep your eyes on on your afterlife in heaven. And they've extrapolated that out even past where the Puritans kept it to say that environmentalism or, you know, ecological concern is focusing on on the fallen earth and that that is that since God is or Yahweh is supposed to be completely separate and apart from the world that to focus on the world is to focus away from God. And it's actually a pretty fracked up way to think about things, but I know where they're at. I mean, I was raised among them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't go to family reunions. (laughs) And not everybody here is like that, but there's enough of them. Mm -hmm. And there's also a prejudice against anything that's terribly different and not fairly homogenous. And the way I ain't the way grandma did it. Mm-hmm. that people that aren't like that either tend to move away or just kind of keep quiet. Yeah. Rather like those people who were raised being told that if you don't eat everything on your plate, you are disrespecting your mother's cooking, okay? Is that if you don't use up every aspect of this planet so that there is nothing left to support us, that's good, and when this happens, God will take us all to a new planet. Oh, boy. Well, I wish yeah, I was making uh, this up. I uh, wish I was making that up. Well, and again, know, it's not everybody, but there's enough of them to be no. darned annoying. Yeah. yeah. I used to live and in the work for fishing game. Yeah. When I used to live in the Cayman Islands, we, you know, I went to a, uh, a Christian school there, and in school, I was literally taught that John Lennon and Frank Sinatra were advocates of Satan, and that Gandhi oh, yeah. went to hell yeah. with Hitler, while Ted Bundy is sipping dew with Jesus in heaven. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so- there's... There's crap like that floating around here and there, and it's, it, I mean, it, it's that same old, you know, dear Lord, see, you know, please save us from your people. I and mean, what was it Gandhi said? I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. They are not much like your Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a, he was a good boy for some t-shirt quotes. I'm telling you. Oh look, Amber, <laughs> it's last week's topic all over again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm been like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about the the most radical and the most absurd one I saw though was from some um uh, yeah um pro pro hostility pro war in Iraq etc advocates who were holding up a great big sign on the street corner that mm-hmm. said peace is treason. <clears throat> yeah, we have the we have the the oh what the bugger all do you call them? Um, Morons. The peak, no, the peak <laughs> movement were the anti-war peace yeah. protesters, mm-hmm. and these guys are the anti. They call themselves the anti-pinks or something like that or whatever, and they yeah. they set up anywhere where there's a peace protest you know going on with bullhorns and stuff, mm-hmm. and start screaming about. Uh, peace being treason and anybody who wants peace or whatever should be tried for treason and wow. shot with some type of sufficiently large ordinance or something like that out over the ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, they're easy to counter, though, because I found out that if you pull up in the parking lot where they're staked out at and play Afra Haza really, really loud on a really good <laughs> kickbox, 
they, they really get <laughs> they just they turn purple they turn all these really cool it kind of looks tie-dye in a way you know it just i think these oh. poor people are allergic to the indigo girls it's funny <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> it's you know it, and it's a it's a it's an ingrained culture they don't like change and yeah. the odd thing about it is that on the same note that i've got i've got hunters that will give me bone and remains and things to do things with and they think and i just tell them that oh i make bone carvings Mm-hmm. And I think that's cool, but I'm running out of time on some of that because they keep wanting me to show them what I'm doing with it. And if mm-hmm. I actually told them what I was making with most of it, they would go gazoo because I make, um, I use the hooves for uh, drum rattles mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. certain things like that. And I've used um, the toes I make and the foot bones and stuff and everything, the metatarsals I make jewelry out of, but I've also made some ceremonial gear and some priestess bling, whatever mm-hmm. the thing wants. Um, I've made wands out of several leg bones. They make a fantastic leg bone, and mm-hmm. they also apparently really, really like to be uh, drumsticks or drum beaters, like brand beaters. Mm-hmm. And if I actually told most of them what I was making their stuff into, they'd probably wet themselves. <laughs> I don't know. I think they might like the rattles. No, 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 no. We have, no. We have people <laughs> here that use rattles. We have a drum. Tell we have them. drum circles on the square in Charlotte. That there's a particular group of police officers that, even though we have a permit to have it, will shut us down and make us leave. Because and there are people around here that, if they find out you're having a drum circle in a public place, they will try to get it shut down and get the police to run you off. We have those we have people, in the middle we have people of the here that protest the mm-hmm. Renaissance Festival for crying out loud. It just anyway. Just. It, it, <laughs> I've done I've I've done my bitch quota for the evening. It's <laughs> I, I've gone past, I've gone past I'm actually lending something to what I'm talking about with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after our thirty minute tangent about Christians, do we have any more topics? <laughs> <laughs> See? I was being a good girl. For once. Hmm? <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Well, we're talking about the, uh, the police taking things and shutting you down. Sarah, have, what's the most common complaint or misconception that you've come across from people when dealing with the animal parts? Um, a lot of people are concerned that, um, you know, like using certain parts and stuff um, is illegal. Um, I get that a lot with, uh, like, wolves, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, it's... It, I personally kind of find it like a little bit hilarious because if you actually look at the, um, <clears throat> like they have this uh, list called the red list of endangered species, um, wolves are actually listed of least concern because most subspecies are not endangered. Granted, there are, you know, several subspecies that indeed are, and, you know, they are really in need of protection. And that's the reason that they have, you know, CITES permits for animals like gray wolves, even though they're not endangered. Um, it's because they're a look-alike animal, and that it'll be really easy to confuse the skin of a gray wolf with that of an endangered red wolf. And, you know, that would only fuel the trade for it, which is why everything comes with a CITES permit. Cool. Yep, documentation, <laughs> documentation, documentation. Mm-hmm. The other one that's really, really difficult is um, working with antique stuff because there's a whole different set of laws, you know, regarding the the sell and the trade of um, parts from antique endangered species. Partly, uh, I had this huge controversy over a tiger tooth that I sold, and this tiger tooth had, like, a really, really strong, you know, energy to it, and I was like... I don't really want this, it's just too much for me, but I know that somebody would absolutely love this, and so I wanted to sell it. And um, it was legal to sell because the tooth predates 1947, and I had it looked at by two different antiques dealers, and they both agreed. And still, after I listed it, it was getting reported, and that's because yeah, there's laws about, you know, where you can and cannot ship to, and... One common misconception is that uh, parts from um, like pre-banned species cannot go over state lines. 
but that's actually not true if you actually look um i forget which chapter it was of the whole cites handbook thing but um if you look at one of their articles, it actually does say that CITES animals that are normally listed as um, an Appendix 1 species, which is the most endangered, mm -hmm. if that species is from the pre-ban era, then it's treated as a um, Appendix 2 species, which means mm -hmm. that it can cross state lines, but it cannot leave the country. Yeah. Hmm. If you can get people that actually know the law, that's the other fun thing that's the fun is that it, I don't honestly trust a lot of the the professionals we have around here mm -hmm. to really actually understand the law that they're supposed to be enforcing. And yeah, that might be I, horribly cynical of me, but it, so far that seem, does kind of seem to be something to keep in mind. Um, that's Again, that's one of the other reasons why I'm like documentation all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of hilarious. I've, I've, you know, called the Fish and Game Department here before about, you know, certain situations with, um, uh, I had a friend that wanted to have a wolf ship to Australia. And, of course, they don't have any native wolves in Australia. They only have the dingo, which is non-native to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm like, well, maybe that would be one that I could ship to. I just need to get the uh, CITES permit from here in the United States, their Fish and Game Department. And, you know, calling around, I was getting different stories from everybody. You know, some people were saying, no, you can't ship it there because dingoes are a native species. I'm like, well, obviously they're not. Um, and, you know, I talked to somebody else and they said, oh, yeah, you know, you don't even have to have a permit for it. I'm like, I don't think that's true. And I don't want to get busted if it's not. So, yeah. Still working it's, on it. It's been, you know, three or four days, and I keep getting different stories from everybody's, so. It's messy. It's yeah. really messy. And you're like, okay, who do I believe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to clarify, what law was passed in 1947? Um, 1947 was the ban on exotic cat skins and parts. So anything that was uh, like a, a leopard or jaguar, cheetah, um, tiger. Okay. Yeah. Ocelots as well. Most most of the big cats or the wild cats, really. So. Hmm. Well, I just realized we are going on two hours. Yeah, and I actually had a meeting. I was supposed to be out at seven, but hey, it's okay. I can be late. <laughs> <laughs> just in time for donuts. Yeah, donuts. Oh, what a segue! <laughs> Yay. Oh, here so in Oregon, we have a pita pit. Love that place. It's like Subway for pita sandwiches. Oh, Ooh. good deal. Ooh. Yeah, another reason to move to Oregon. <laughs> that sounds like sounds kind of like roly-poly here. That sounds good. Okay, yeah, yeah. all right. We're, you know, yes. pack Both the dogs. Trip. <laughs> pack the dogs. <laughs> well, if nobody has anything else, we could wrap up and do final thoughts. We could certainly wrap up. We have to think? Oh, no. Well, hang on. Let me do an oh, ad. It'll give you like a minute to think. I've been oh, rambling on, on just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with wrapping up if everybody else is. No more questions <laughs> or anything? I absolutely love your stuff. Well, thank you. I'm, I don't always do a whole lot online just because I like to be able to get my hands on things. Yeah. But just looking at your site... I don't really see anything on here that comes back at me as I'm not happy with this arrangement. Mm -hmm. And I have I have run across a few things online where it was like jumping out at going, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. I'm not mm -hmm. getting anything like that off of your site. Well, thank you. Thank you very and much. If you ever come you're, to North Carolina. You're mm -hmm. apparently making some people happy. <laughs> I think that if you come to North Carolina... There is a whale hanging in a museum in Raleigh that you have oh to meet. Oh, my. <laughs> There's, it's, a, it's a right whale, and he's a preserved skeleton hanging from the ceiling in the natural um, history in Raleigh, in downtown. Um, they have him named Mayflower. As far as I can tell, his name is not Mayflower. His name is Tail Slap with a twist. <laughs> uh, he thinks he is... The it boy, as far as he's concerned. The, the other ones I've got hanging from the ceiling, I don't think there's anything connected with them at all. But as far as I can tell with him, he thinks that all the school children that come in and look up at him and go, ooh, and cool and stuff like that are sort of his followers. Mm. 
and he's, <laughs> he's loud. Cool. And he's <laughs> that's hilarious. Your face. Now that's another UPG that I like to lab rat. So it's um, if anybody else gets by there or whatever, let me know what you think and what you get out of it. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, if I'm ever around there, I will definitely have to check out the uh, the whale. <laughs> so, so our chat room has come up with a unique idea so we can avoid thinking about final thoughts this week. Uh, maybe everybody should wrap up by <laughs> saying their favorite donut. Okay. I'm going to have to start then because that's definitely something I can pounce on. <laughs> um, in Portland, where I'm originally from, we have a shop called Voodoo Donuts. And this place makes the most awesome tasty donuts ever i don't know if i'm actually allowed to say this but they have a cock and balls donut which is cream filled <laughs> cool. I mean, obviously it's 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 resembling a chicken and some meatballs you know <laughs> absolutely absolutely especially in oregon <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the season, they'll have different frosting on it. So last time I was there, I say Patrick's Day, so they had green frosting on the cock and balls donut. And <laughs> yeah, I have to say that was probably my favorite. That and the bacon maple bar. They have maple bars with like three strips of bacon just laid right across, and it's awesome. Yeah, that cool. was actually uh, what got us onto donuts about two hours ago to chat. Uh huh. Do donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Oh my goodness! Yeah, no, Voodoo is awesome. I love that place. It's kind of like my version of communion. <laughs> so there's this awesome donut place in Texas, and people come from all over Texas, which is a pretty big, big state, mm -hmm. to go to Round Rock Donuts. And we actually have a listener in Round Rock tonight, so they know all about Round Rock Donuts, and they make the most amazing glazed donut. I hate glazed donuts, and this place makes an amazing glazed donut. They make lots of different donuts. They have all different flavors. They have the, the, the one donut that's like a half dozen donuts in one. Now, that regular glazed donut is amazing. It's fried in peanut oil. It's mm -hmm. full of when. Um, but there's also a local I'm hungry super, now. There's a local supermarket called HB, at HEB, and I totally have gotten hooked on the old-fashioned um, chocolate-flavored sourdough donut, which oh. is also pretty good. It, it holds me over until I can get back to Round Rock. I'm probably something heretical, and I confess my favorite donut is funnel cakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that counts. <laughs> it's sort of just like a donut that you know. That's with an identity crisis. Yes, ergonomically <laughs> challenged donut. Uh, well, Mine's compared to Sarah's. Uh, Compared to Sarah's choices, I think my favorite, the Bavarian cream, is quite dull. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it shaped like a penis? <laughs> I'm sure it could be. <laughs> hey, you're an artist. You can sculpt with your teeth. <laughs> there oh. we go. Uh, oh. It's two ding-dongs and a Twinkie. Work on it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, God. <laughs> <clears throat> I absolutely, absolutely used to love Krispy Kreme's blueberry-filled powdered donuts. And this was not full of blueberry jelly. It was more like blueberry compote, like they put on your pancakes at IHOP. Mm. And the f rotten, festering, <laughs> bilious <laughs> bastards don't make them anymore. Oh. It's Criminal. I'm just going to have to learn how to do it myself. Yeah. And I'm looking text. forward to making lots of mistakes in the process. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the Deep South. Waffle House is open. Um. <laughs> Waffle House is open. All right, we got Maria, Saturn, Saturn, and Barrett. I go. <clears throat> I don't even have to think for mine. The wolves gave it to me. They say hello. They <laughs> want their complete indifference to the topic expressed. And have agreed on a coconut glazed with cranberry filling. Oh, nice. interesting oh, choice. That sounds decent. Yeah. Interesting choice. Yeah. Love cranberries. 
<laughs> For me, Better? I'd have to say either blueberry glaze or Boston cream. Anything blueberry is good. I applaud your taste. I despise whenever they make the ones that look like they're Boston cream, but then they have frosting inside them. Or, or, yeah. or worse, they have that white cream instead. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, Barrett. Barrett, what about you? Barrett! Well, my favorite donut is the Boston cream. And I just, want, just wanted to say that it's been really interesting listening to the conversation. I had nothing to add, but it's been really interesting listening. <laughs> See, and this is why we gave you your own show. This way, you're, you're such a talkative person, you can have your own podcast. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm getting better, and I would have talked if I had something to add, but I really yeah. didn't. Yeah, same here. I didn't really make jewelry, so... But you didn't, you didn't, like, run for a bucket at any point either and make particularly evocative noises, so I think you're doing great. <laughs> so I think yeah, it's been... happened in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like that, that the avatar that Barrett has has a picture of a dick dick. <laughs> so while we're on the oh, they're cute. <laughs> so they're adorable. Cute. They're cute. They are I'm cute. not showing one on here. That's because you're probably not as a friend. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not your friend, man. <laughs> I think the only last note I have is when it comes to the vending, Sarah. That's mm-hmm. why we go to other states and other towns where we vend our first time. So we can get all of our frustration out and practice for when we go back home. That sounds like a very good idea, actually. I, I'm probably going to have to try that. I know that we have a, a fairs like up in Washington and stuff, so it'll be something I'll have to do. But That's yeah, strategy right there. Thank you for advice and everything. <laughs> it's been nice talking to you guys. It's been oh, nice to meet you, Jack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Amber, you will let me know when the uh, headdress arrives? I shall, and I still have to send you what I made. Okay, thank you. So, mm-hmm. All right. Thanks again so much for coming on. Yeah, no problem. It was a lot of fun. Very, very enjoyable. Nice to meet you, Jake. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. All of you. Yeah. Thank you. All right.